You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Another episode coming up with a veteran who went to a career field after the military that you don't exactly expect, so stay tuned for that. But before we get started with the episode, we have an announcement, and this is an announcement that I always love to make. You guys have heard me tell you about our partnership with Amazon. You know, you can go to our website, hazardground.com, either on your computer or on your smartphone, click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or on the sponsors tab, and it'll take you right to Amazon. You do all your normal Amazon shopping. We get a percentage of what you guys spend, but we donate that back. Well, this is one of the times where we get to tell you that we have made another donation to an organization called Veterans Moving Forward. Veterans Moving Forward is a 501c3 nonprofit organization headquartered in Dulles, Virginia. VMF provides service dogs and canine therapy services to veterans with physical and or mental health challenges at no cost to the veteran. VMF services are available to any veteran of any generation, so it doesn't have to be the war on terror. It could be any of the conflicts that we have fought in throughout American history who have served honorably, has physical and or mental challenges resulting from military operations and or accident or disease experienced during or subsequent to military service. They live in the continent, United States, Hawaii, and Alaska, and can benefit from a service dog. We also recently interviewed VMS President and CEO Gordon Sumner, which we'll be releasing in a future Hazard Ground episode, so stay tuned for that. And if you want to learn more about VMF and their services, you can check them out on the web at www.vetsfwd.org. Again, vetsfwd.org. Again, vets, fox, whiskey, delta.org. Also want to remind you guys to follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Keep up with everything that we have going on with the show. It's a great place to send us suggestions. Just drop us a comment. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. We always check those social media accounts and try to respond to everybody. So we can't wait to hear more from you guys. I've done enough talking so far. Let's get on with this week's episode. And joining us now is a retired Marine captain. He spent six years in the Marine Corps with one deployment to Afghanistan. He was medically discharged as well, although not through wounds in combat. He is the CEO and founder of Vet TV, also known as Veteran Television, a streaming video on demand or SVOD channel that has often been referred to as the Comedy Central of the military. He is also the founder of Irreverent Warriors, a nonprofit organization that helps veterans with mental health and suicide prevention. He is Donnie O'Malley joining us on the Hazard Ground podcast. Donnie, welcome, man. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Vet TV is a widely known thing in the veterans community. Um, it is great humor, very satirical, very dry, but a whole lot of fun. And it's certainly, it, for people who aren't familiar with it, get familiar with it if you're a veteran, because it certainly speaks the same language that you're used to. So congratulations on all the success there and certainly everything that you've grown over a period here with Vet TV and, and you know, just the work that you're doing there, man, every day is 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 impressive stuff. Thank you so much, man. It's been a it's been a brutal grind. Let me tell you, a brutal grind. But um, but it's it's so worth it. And it's been such an incredible experience getting to dream things up and then turn the dreams into reality. And, and do so with people that I love while working for a community that I love, and that being the, the military community. I, I, I truly believe that I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Outstanding. So tell me how that military career started for you. Um, started as a kid watching, um, Vietnam war movies. And for some reason thinking to myself, Oh my God, I have to do that. And, uh, and, and which is weird because in Vietnam war movies, Americans get fucked up (laughs) in every one. (laughs) There's no, there was no glory in that war. So, um, I somehow was like, God, I have to do that. And then it stuck around with me uh, all the way through college. And um, then finally, I was like, okay, I'm doing it. And my dad tried to convince me not to because he was a Marine infantry officer too. And uh, I, I, I stayed true to what I knew I had to do with my life. And then fin- I had to have a couple surgeries before I joined because I, uh, uh, I had dislocating shoulders. And so had to have those things fixed up and I ended up joining at 25. 
25 years old that had a couple businesses going on and just let it all go to go live the dream in the Marine Corps. Did you go, finish go your, did you finish your degree before you had enlisted? Oh, I did. Yeah. I finished my degree at 22 okay. and then joined in at uh, 25. Now, did you know you were going to be an officer? Is that what you wanted to be? Or were you just wanted to be a regular grunt and, and, and ended up working out that way? No, I wanted to be an officer after my dad had, had explained more of it to me. He was just like, he's just basically like, look, you have to just trust me on this one. Like, you're going to have a good time no matter what, but you're going to get really, really frustrated if you go in at the very bottom and you've got some fucking stupid ass lieutenant telling you what to do and trying to be a leader when you know you're better than him. He's like, you're, it's going to frustrate you. Just go in there and lead a platoon and just be the guy that you've always been. So he was right. Where were you on 9-11? Um, my dorm room, San Diego State, freshman year. And so e even at that, you didn't drop everything then and there, huh? Well, uh, I went to the recruiting office, and my dad really, really um, intensely uh, convinced me away from it because he said, look, if war is what you want – this war is not going anywhere for a long time. Just finish your degree, and then if you still have the itch to go to war, do it. And that's what I did. It's kind of funny that your dad knew that because we all thought, shit, uh, you know, we went in there, kicked the crap out of him, and uh, this was done, it was over. And in reality, you know, it kind of was. We just didn't know we were going to hang around for another, you know, 15, 20 years. <laughs> yeah. So just kind, of, just kind of odd that he had that foresight. Um all right, so uh, you end up going through boot camp. Um, toughest part of that experience for you? It's not being able to laugh and be myself. Having to suppress my personality to fit in this new environment. That was the hardest part. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I mean, choosing the Marines of all the branches, I know your dad was one, but you had to know that they were going to be the tightest and the strictest, right? If you were somebody who had a little bit of a, uh, a reverent personality, uh, why did you think this was going to be a good fit for you? Um, I knew exactly what would be ex expected of me and I was still happy to do it. Like I just, I had to be a Marine and, um, I, you know, I say that that was the hardest part, but it wasn't that hard. You know, like, honestly, none of it was. So, uh, you know, it was just, it was just, you know, I, I accepted what I had to become in order to be what the Marine Corps needed me to be. And I'm incredibly fortunate that I had that understanding before going in. I think that's why I didn't, I didn't change at all going in. I didn't come back fucked up in the head. Like I was, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. We're doing a mental health podcast that we've been starting now. And, um, I was so mentally prepared for the Marine Corps and for war, uh, that it, you know, I'm now able to help others repair the damage that they have experienced. Um, because I have such a healthy mindset and have for many years. And that part of that is, is good fortune. And then part of that is, I, f I studied it and I focused on exactly what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. And then once I was in the Marine Corps, I, I, I had very few surprises. I had like already seen it all play out in my head in many ways before going in. So it's like, yeah, that's the hardest thing, but it really wasn't that hard. You know, I had my moments at night when the DIs would leave and turn off the lights. I'd go to the bathroom and then I'd be making guys laugh and telling stories. And, you know, I, I, I finally got to get it out and be myself for a few minutes and then go back into my, you know, into the squad bay and do it all again from that night till the next day. I've done my homework on you, Donnie. And, and uh, you know, on the surface, it seems like you would have a complicated relationship with the Marines, not only from a personality standpoint, but just from a kind of, uh, let's call it a leadership style standpoint, if that makes any sense. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, I, I know, it, I know we're early on, you know, chronologically in your career, but you just kind of hit on the note. And so I wanted to just stay with it for a moment in the sense that did, did you, do you feel like you had a complicated relationship with the Marine Corps? 
when I was in, I never thought that. Um, I just thought, yeah, this is what I joined up for. It wasn't until I got into the, like everything up until the fleet. I'm like, yeah, this is, this is exactly what I expected. But then when I got to the fleet and my first few company commanders, um, like really let me down in terms of the example that they set and in terms of the way they conducted themselves and did their job as company commanders and mentored us lieutenants, I was massively let down. And it was, you know, I, I don't want to say that that at the time it, you know, made me feel like I had a complicated relationship with the Marine Corps. I had a complicated relationship with my company commanders because I, it, it was so hard to respect them in, in so many instances when they're just blatant, blatant, you know, uh, lack, uh, blatant incompetence and, uh, you know, lackadaisical attitude when it came to the, the orders process and preparing for training ops and preparing for war. I'm just like, this is nothing like my IOC instructors. My IOC instructors were fucking gods to this day. Those dudes are, will be, I will fucking shake in their presence to the day I die. That's how badass those dudes were. Not just the way that they trained us and conducted themselves, but also all of them had were most of them were, were uh, prior enlisted and they had a bunch of combat pumps, and they were just battle hardened dudes and they were gangsters and they treated us with respect. They treated us like men, but at the same time they you know they held us to an insanely high standard. And I was so grateful for that experience. And then when I got to the fleet, these company commanders were not that. And it was such a letdown and it, that created massive anger and resentment in me because I even went to my, um, my battalion XO when I was in combat. When I heard that my company commander was getting written up for a Bronze Star with V, I, I was on the verge of, of, of hitting an officer in the face. So I wrote an email to the battalion executive officer and I'm like, sir, I've kept my mouth shut long enough. I, 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 I'm ashamed of myself that I haven't spoken up s sooner because he, his incompetence is embarrassing. He, I've watched him do things that I have had my squad leaders get fired for at ISLIC, Infantry Squad Leader Course. And I've watched him display incompetence at a degree 10 times what my squad leaders did at ISLIC. And yet he hasn't been relieved of his command. And so now to hear that he's going to get a bronze star with a V, it makes me want to, it makes me have lose massive respect for my leadership, for the command and for the, for that award. So let me tell you my observations of my company commander. I've put this 10 page email to this guy while I'm a Lieutenant in combat. And, um, I knew I could be fired immediately. I didn't give a fuck. I'm like, combat operations were done. Like I did what I set out to do when I joined, I wanted to go to war and I wanted to do cool shit. I wanted to fly into fucking villages and go raid shit. I, I, I lived my dream. And okay, if I get fired now, I don't give a fuck. I don't have much longer in the Marine Corps. Um, and uh, and so uh, I, I let it all out. And then I sat down and had a talk with him. And he kind of agreed with me a little bit. And then he, you know, he eventually the conversation turned into, because I wouldn't let up, it turned into, okay, it's enough, Lieutenant. But um that then that that frustration that I felt there in combat ultimately led to my book, which then led to the movie A Grunt's Life and the, sh the show A Grunt's Life, which is our Game of Thrones. That's what built Vet TV um, was that show in terms of a product that people were willing to buy in mass mass numbers. And it all emanated out of my relationship with that company commander in combat. So it's interesting. now. <laughs> yeah. N now that I'm out. Um, now I have a complicated relationship with the Marine Corps because I'm hearing about how it's changing and the way that it's changing is infuriating and scary thinking about the defense of a nation. And as a Patriot, I'm like, I'm disgusted with the Marine Corps now. So now my relationship is complicated because I love it, but I'm losing respect for it as an institution. 
I got to tell you, I mean, I've said this a bunch about, you know, my career, you know, one of the, I guess, regrets I've had about my career is I wish I wasn't such a punk ass lieutenant, right? Like, I I wish that I didn't walk (laughs) around at like a cocky SOB, like I was smarter than everybody and, and looked around at everybody, you know, who said something that was slightly, you know, didn't pass my common sense test, which of course was the barometer for everything. Like this guy's a moron. (laughs) Um, But, but see, the difference is, is that you were able to sit there and go, it's a problem with the individuals, not with the organization. At my age, at 21, 22 years old, I wasn't aware enough or smart enough to look at it and go, well, that's just a problem with that individual. It's not the army, right? And, and I just wrote it off as a young guy. I was like, this is the army. These people are stupid. Of course, this is you know, prior to 9-11, um, so it was a different world and a different environment. But uh, I, I give you a lot of credit for recognizing that because I think it's easy to just p- paint one Marine officer as all the same, or one officer is all the same, or one leader is all the same. And in reality, both of our organizations, Army and Marines, they're extremely diverse for a reason. They bring a lot of different things to the table, and the individuals um, aren't all exactly the same. I just, you know, I, I thought that was noteworthy that you were able to figure that out. Huh. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, I, I, I want to say it is because of my training pipe. My training pipeline defined my image of the Marine Corps, my opinion of the Marine Corps and my training pipeline was fucking amazing from start until I hit the fleet. It was, I mean, there was very few times when I wasn't incredibly impressed, even with my drill instructors, with the way they, you know, their camis were looked like they were starched as they're PTing us, you know, like everything was impressive to me. And so yeah, I think that's probably why I still maintained a positive image of the organization and, and didn't generalize. That's probably why. You talked about, you know, your your instructors at OCS, um, you know, obviously still holding them in a high regard. W- was there anything about OCS that kind of made you ever question the decision? Did, did you ever think that it was, you, you had made the wrong one at any point in time? Nope. There was, I, there was never a moment when I felt doubt. Not a single moment that that I had made the wrong decision. There were a couple moments when I felt doubt when I was fucking up and I I failed a um ugh, what did I do? I failed one of my leadership evals and I thought, oh fuck. I need to take this more seriously so that I don't fuck this up. Cause I went into it like the whole thing was a joke. Um and you know, any chance that I could goof off, which they were so rare. Um, I did. And, um, you know, physically nothing was, was, was really challenging in OCS at all. It was really just, um, you know, staying on top of all of the stupid little things, like constantly having to redo the name tapes, like constantly. And I'm just like, that's a waste of time. My, like my, my name tape is fine. And, you know, not taking those little things seriously. The drill instructors brought the heat on me because they're like, oh, this, this fucking guy thinks that he's above this. And rightfully so. I absolutely did. And so it was a few times when I thought to myself, oh, fuck, I need to take this more seriously so that I don't fuck this up. And, but that was it. I never, that was, that was the only really negative emotion I ever felt. And it was very short lived because as soon as I stepped my game up, I'm, I'm fine. After you graduate from OCS, how quickly do you get to the fleet and into a deployment? So it was it was officer candidate school, OCS, and then it was the basic school. Okay. And that's a six-month long course. That was incredible. Um, challenging, but a fun time. And, um, and then after that, there was three months where – what the fuck did I do? For, it was three months in between the basic school and infantry officer course. And I took a, we all did a martial arts instructor course. That was a great time. And then IOC a month later. So it was from, from the day I got into OCS, it was like 13, 14 months before I hit the fleet. Are you chomping at the bit or are you just like, Jesus, when is this stuff going to be over? Like I, I've done, I feel like I've done all this already. Or is each sort of, you know, new set of school, a, a something else that you needed to know you feel like? No, I mean, I knew exactly what the, the, the timeline would be. And so I never, I could do to expedite the process. So I was just, 
I know. I, I never thought that. I'm just like, yes. I, I just couldn't wait to hit the fleet and then get a platoon and train for war and go to war. So I was excited for it, but I don't know. I'm, I don't give myself more anxiety than I need. Did you think with all the sort of, you know, jovial nature of how you were, that these young grunts, these young Marines that you were going to end up being a platoon commander of, did you think that they would ever not take you seriously because of that? Uh, yeah, I did think about that a little bit and worry a little bit of that. Um, and I knew that, um, I just, I, I knew that as long as I was pretty real with them and like, you know, didn't make an effort to hide that I'm a fucking hard partier and, um, you know, a goof. So as long as I didn't hide it, I knew that they would, they would, they could respect that, you know, like I'm a dude, I'm a bro. Like, and, and the way I approached my platoon is like, these are all my little brothers and, you know, I got to take care of my boys. And I, you know, and I, I was the president of my fraternity twice. And honestly, that was fucking 10 times as hard as being a platoon commander. Uh, cause it's a bunch of fucking, you know, 18 to 22 year old frat boys who don't really have to listen to me. And, but I had to get them to listen to me. So I, my leadership challenge was, was, was sooner than the Marine Corps. And I, that, that experience actually helped me a lot. Um, so coming to my platoon, I just knew I, I just had to fucking keep my really crazy side uh, away from them and just keep it to not even the other lieutenants. I, I, I usually went back because I was stationed in, uh, um, Pendleton, San Clemente two five. So I would just drive down from San Clemente to Pacific beach where my brothers lived. And I was just hanging out with my brothers every weekend. And every now and then I'd bring one of my Lieutenant buddies with me who was like, who I knew was cool and like me and my friends. And so I kind of had two lives had my Marine Corps life and then I had my, my civilian life, which they, they, they drill into you. There is no such thing. You're an officer 24 seven, but that I just can't live like that. I, I had to get away from that life to be able to be me and, um, express myself the way I'm naturally inclined on the weekends. And that kept me sane. So, I mean, it's funny. I, I was the same exact way as a Lieutenant. Now again, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't want to hang out with other army people. Didn't want to be around them on the weekends. I wanted to cut loose. I didn't want to, you know, uh, do that, you know, esprit de corps thing. And I hated mandatory fun. And um, <laughs> I, I was, you know, I despised the idea of having to go to military events. And again, I, I think part of that was just my immaturity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, now you understand, I think after doing it for 20 plus years, there is a certain need in leadership positions to see you there. Now as a lieutenant, it's, to, you know, when you're, you're a lieutenant colonel. It's different because uh, you're the ones overseeing all these events, so you have to put a different face on it. But you know, I, I think there is some merit to some of these things when you're a little bit of higher grade. But as a lieutenant, it's like Jesus. I don't want. I, I work with these people five days a week. Like I want to spend my weekend with them. Like this is you know more agony than I want to deal with at this point. Yes. Um, but I never had a problem not hanging out with my 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 soldiers, which I wasn't supposed to do <laughs> at the time. Um, but it was always the, those are the guys I always wanted to hang out with. Those are the guys I wouldn't mind. Hey, I'm going over here, going out to this bar for the weekend. Meet me out for a beer, you know, like because I related to them better. But I made an effort to relate to them because I I just kind of felt like I didn't fit in, in the officer corps early on in my career. Wow, that's wild. You know, I, I always I always felt like I was the black sheep of the officers. I remember I had an E seven. Um, a sergeant first club, one of the other platoon sergeants, tell me openly in a meeting, you'll never get promoted to major, sir. And he said, why? He goes, you don't kiss enough ass. And uh, <laughs> I, I never forgot that. And the day I pinned on major, I just kind of chuckled to myself. I said, I wonder where he is right now, if you could see this, what he would say. So uh, I, I think you and I are, are a little bit alike in that sense as far as uh, early on in our careers. But uh, uh, and, and sometimes the things straighten out, you know, the way it's supposed to be. I, I always kind of remark that the army and I think the military in general has, has a uh, uncanny way of putting you where you're supposed to be, right? Like for uh. the most part, you end up being where you're supposed to be at the right time and leading the right people. If, if, if you, you're doing your job correctly. You know, I have, I've heard and seen that and experienced that, um, many times. That's so crazy. 
haven't thought about that in a while. So when you get to the fleet, um, what's your first assignment and, you know, what are you doing? And again, how quickly do you get to this deployment? Oh, you know what? I haven't told the story in such a long time, but I hope you appreciate it. I think you will. I get to the fleet. <clears throat> I check in uh, a little bit later than my other lieutenant buddies. Like all the lieutenants wanted to get together and, you know, do something. And with, with one of the more senior officers in the battalion and it seemed like a kiss ass thing. And I was the only lieutenant who didn't show up. I showed up on my own time <laughs> to check in. And I was one of the last ones from my IOC class or from that, the group that was supposed to check in that day. And, um, when I did, I met the, I think it was the battalion commander first and he was great. He was actually the, you ever seen generation kill? Yes. So he was the executive officer in Generation Kill. Interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, the Recon XO. So, and he had a great reputation. A really well loved and respected guy. He had barrel chested, fucking big, uh, not big, but you know, like a, a little. Uh, he didn't have a six pack. He had like a fucking a keg in there, but it was. He just looked like he was all muscle. And um, he just loved being outside hiking and, and running and shit. And he always smiling. It's such a great fucking Marine kind of legend. Anyway, so I met him and he was soft spoken. He was nice. He was cool. And uh, I was so surprised. And then I see I meet the XO. And he's a little more hard, more stern. And uh, he he was stern, but he, he wasn't like a blatant asshole. Still, you know, treating me like a man. And then he said, all right, anything else, Lieutenant? And I'm like, uh, yes, sir. I just uh, just want to ask, what are the chances that I get to be a platoon commander instead of uh, going uh, being an ETT, uh, embedded training team leader? Um, do you know what that is? No. Um, and MIT, have you ever heard of MIT? Oh, yeah, the MIT teams, yes. Okay. Yeah, okay, so same same kind of thing. Gotcha. Um, and what we had all been told, all the lieutenants, was that we, we're not all going to be platoon commanders. Like, there's a, there's at least a third of us that are going to immediately upon checking into the battalion, we're going to be um, be you become embedded training team leaders and then have a totally different training pipeline. We don't get a platoon, we get a ragtag group of fucking gr grunts and pogues who are going to you know that we're going to deploy with and embed with an Afghan army unit, which you know just sounds. I mean, those are the guys who get fucked up. So. And my dream was to be a platoon commander. So we're all scared. And he asked me anything else. He's just checking, sir, what, what are the chances I get to be a platoon commander and not a ETT leader? And he goes, uh, I don't know, 50-50. Why? And I said, well, um, <clears throat> sir, I, uh, uh, I, I, I didn't join the Marine Corps to be an embedded training team leader. I joined to be a platoon commander. And he, he held, he like, he was like reading something in his hands and he puts his hands down and he looks at me infuriated. And he goes, you'll do whatever the fuck you're told to do, Lieutenant. And I'm like, uh, yes, sir. Aye, aye, sir. He goes, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that, that story he told to the battalion commander and it went, it got all around the battalion. And when we did my hail, we do these really cool things called hail and farewells. Yeah, we Everyone, got them in the army. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool, cool. And in my hail, the battalion commander announces uh, all of the officers, and he also tells you what your billet's going to be. And he says, um, this guy right here, real motivator, he uh, he told the XO he wasn't going to be a fucking ETT, and thank God he did because he's going to be a first platoon commander in Echo Company. Congratulations. And I was like, oh, thank God. Wow. <laughs> I got so lucky that could have ended so poorly for me. Listen, no guts, no glory, right? Take a shot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, oh. I, you know, the, the the officers, they respected officers that had balls because, you know, you, you get a mixture. You get a mixture of guys that have been around the block and have experience. And you get some fucking kids who are 22 and they've never led anything in their life. They've never been in charge of anyone but themselves. Now they're going to get a platoon. And, you know, I think if you're a senior officer, if you're a company commander, XO, battalion commander, like – you can kind of get a sense of, of who each of these new lieutenants are. And, um, and so they were looking back on it. I think they were really keen to that kind of thing. 
So it, it would have worked in my favor. Well, you know what it is? I mean, and again, I, I, I realize this more now after having had battalion command. And, and this is really where a lot of my sort of awakening of what kind of lieutenant I was is when I really, <laughs> as, as well, I mean, because you, you just hit on it. Like when you look at it from a command standpoint as an 05 and you're evaluating the next generation of officers who are going to run and, and take these young men and women into combat, right? Like that, this is a serious job and, and allowing lieutenants to just kind of float around. At least this happens in the army. I don't know how it happens in the Marine Corps, but general lieutenants can float around for, for 36 months, 42 months and, and end up pinning on captain bars. And it's like, well, I'm ready to be a commander. No, the fuck you're not like that. That's not how it works. Like you actually have to do work to understand how to be a company commander. So, you know, I, I when I really started to, to, get in a room. And one of the first things I did my first day in battalion command is I had every single lieutenant in the battalion in a room. And I just wanted to talk to him. And I remember looking around as I'm going through all this thing, just explaining to him, guys, you know, listen, you have to understand, I literally control the next three to five years of your career. Whatever your assignment you get next, I sign off on. And I'm not saying that to scare you, but like you have to understand who you're talking to right now and understand what it is going to be expected of you. And I remember some of them are looking around, they're checking their cell phones, they're just staring at the wall, and no one's looking me in the eye. And I'm like, okay, Whoa! what are your questions? And nobody's saying anything. And I'm like, guys, I don't understand. I can't make this any clearer. If you have a question, now is the time to ask it. And nobody says anything. But had somebody said something in that room to me, I would have had the same reaction that your battalion commander had for you. Finally, somebody who's got the balls to say something. Okay, at least, you know, you're willing to take a shot. Even if you fail, at least I know that you had the initiative to do it. And, and that to me was, it was just kind of like an eye-opening experience that you talked about. And, and, and part of the reason I understand now what a jackass I was as a lieutenant, because I wouldn't have done anything like that. I'm like, this old man in the room, what the hell is he talking about? I don't give a shit. You know, like that would have been the tenor of, the, of my thought process. But in reality, you're being evaluated in that moment. Wow. Yeah. I remember my XO that that's, I'm, I'm, I cannot believe that a lieutenant would would have his phone out and not be looking at you oh, that's yeah. that's insane i've never even even in actually that's not true I, I was i was blatantly disrespectful when i was at the end of my time in afghanistan um and that was because of arrogance but before then i was not at all i was very when at least in the presence of senior officers i was pretty lockstep um so the thought of that that that's fucking wild um but um to your point about being evaluated i remember my company xo he was uh, he was really hard on us and uh, he was raised i don't know it, it it seemed to be old school because everything that he told us was the same shit that my dad told me it was like like i mean identically so um if he had seen that we would have, he would have grabbed us by the fucking collar. And, um, yeah, I, that, that, that's so wild. I remember him telling, yeah, you are constantly being evaluated. Every moment that you exist here in this battalion, you are being evaluated by your company commander and senior officers. And so it really instilled this fear in us of like, well, for, for someone like me, who I'm, I'm just so fucking eccentric, and weird and goofy. I'm just like, okay, I have to completely lock my personality down when I'm on this fucking base. And then when I don't have to be here, I need to get the fuck out of here and hey. <laughs> myself. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Afghanistan, when do you get there? Uh, what's your mission? Where are you in Afghanistan? You know, tell me, tell me all the details. Okay. So I, uh, got to Afghanistan in February or March of 2012. Um, uh, the mission of Fox, Com the whole battalion, our second battalion, fifth Marines was to, um, help break down our bases, transition the Afghan army to then take control and, um, and then pull out. And we knew that pretty, pretty, I don't know, a month or so before we got there, that that's what we were going to do. So, um, we arrived there and uh, it wasn't fighting season, you know, fighting season hadn't picked up yet, but guys were still popping IEDs fucking everywhere. It was nuts. I think we set a record for IEDs popped on via truck. 
Um, I think the battalion as a whole had very few IEDs um, that we stepped on foot. And by very few, I want to say it was like a dozen. Mm -hmm. Um, Isn't that crazy? Like a dozen amputees? It's it's not that bad. Yeah, well, that's exactly (laughs) what I was just thinking. I mean, for context, you know, that's 12 people who lost limbs or died. Uh, and, and that's not a lot as far as, you know, the grand scope of combat is concerned. Yeah. So the, the units before us, um, they had popped so many fucking IEDs with their feet. Um, this is just insane. So, so we went there with a healthy degree of fear and understanding of the IED threat and, and, and our training reflected that. I just can't say enough about the training that we had. We're so lucky that we, we, we learned, we were given lessons that were learned in blood from the several units prior to us. And, um, so then, uh, upon arriving there, IDs everywhere. And as it starts heating up, fighting starts heating up and we are engaged in, um, small coin operations. I mean, it it, it was weird. It was like, we started out trying to, uh, meet with the key leaders and, uh, you know, kind of be engaged in counterinsurgency operations, but not too long after it came from, from battalion and said, okay, no more coin. You're not even going to train the Afghan army anymore. Instead, uh, all we want you to do <laughs> is, um, continue going on patrols that are going to disrupt enemy operations. So what it really turned into was go figure out how to take contact and then, get some fucking kills under your belt and get back to base, refit and do it again. Like that's, that's really what it turned into. And it was, uh, it, it, it was actually quite enjoyable for us. Well, that's because- interesting you say enjoyable. Cause w- when you said that, that sounded like two things to me, go step on some IEDs and, uh, go get into fights for no other reason than we're getting into fights. Like did, did that not pass the common sense test at the time? So, this is this is kind of twofold here. So on one side of it, um, we were excited that we were getting kill missions, right? Like, and then it turned in. It, it, it actually we stopped patrolling at some point after we broke down our small little fob, and then we um, uh, we just did uh, operations, and the operations were just raids, and it was so fucking sick. We got to plan out where we wanted to get dropped into and is usually by helicopter we had to plan out yeah uh this area right here based on you know some people that we had spoken to contact we could t- we had taken previously this will be a good area uh where we're certain that if we insert here um all the cockroaches are going to come to the food and this will be a good area to hold down a fight so let's do that and that's what we did like four times it was, it was a fucking dream. So at the time, as grunts, uh, you know, getting to operate that way, choosing our missions, um, having an uh, incredible amount of air support um, and on all of our missions, it was a freaking dream. Um, towards the end, though, it was just like – so this is how I balanced it out. And, and I, I remember thinking this to myself. I was like – I don't want our bloodlust to get anybody killed unnecessarily Mm -hmm. because while I was there, I was like, I know for a fact that when we leave this place, the Taliban are going to take it all over because I'm looking at this ANA company that we were working with in the beginning. And then these, after, after we left that smaller fob next to the ANA base where I was the liaison, great stories there. And uh, we moved to a larger base that we ran helo ops out of. It was like these Afghans don't give a fuck about their country. Like they don't even speak the language. They don't appear to give a fuck about the local population. They're not like making friends. I had, it was the funniest thing. I my my first mission outside the wire. I had to. Um, uh, you know, I was so proud of creating a good relationship with the um, with the people that we were, you know, talking to in the ANA, in, oh, not the ANA, in this Afghan compound. And then, uh, as we're leaving, I see that the Afghan army guys are stealing their fucking dog, the beautiful <laughs> puppy. 
and they're stealing it. And I'm like, no, fucking put it back. I, you know, telling the interpreter that they had to put the dog back. They were looking at me like I was an asshole for telling them that they can't steal a dog. Right. Like that's, that's how I'm experiencing this. I'm like, who thought this was going to work? And I, and, and I wrote it in my journal. I was like, this is fucking insane. Doing grunt stuff is fun, but I, I want to find the balance and make sure that when we go out and do this stuff, we're not taking any more risk, any more risk than is necessary to accomplish the mission that we are being handed. Um, cause we were told like, you're going out in two weeks, figure out where you're going. And the logic for the battalion was, was that we're going to go out and draw the cockroaches out to us so that the cockroaches aren't attacking the engineers as they're breaking down bases where there's a lack of security. And so, um, so we're like, yeah, sounds cool. It's like, we're bait. Let's, let's go fucking fuck shit up. And, you know, there's plenty of jokes about, you know, good chance we're going to die. Um, and we just kind of, you know, we just made a joke about it. But, um, uh, once we were on the ground in these environments, it was almost like we had to kind of temper what the company commander wanted to do. And it was like, eh, I, I don't recommend we do that. And even some of the sergeants, I remember multiple conversations with a couple of sergeants who these guys were fucking gods to me, but they were getting so cocky that they were coming up with these ideas where I'm just like, no, yo, that is fuck that is not only stupid but unnecessary it was like it was a weird but it was like what a sergeant should be doing to a lieutenant i was saying to these guys like guys we we should absolutely not be driving in that fucking trench like that's a perfect opportunity to get ambushed and fucked up it's like oh no it's all good sir if we get ambushed here we'll just do this this and this this and this and if we get ambushed here it's like okay well how many dudes die from a fucking rpg in a truck uh in that ambush that you are so confident you can get out of like no, we're not doing that. And they, they wanted to, you know, we would, we would take over compounds, draw the enemy to us, and then we would really just defend the compounds. And it's just like, you know, we can achieve the mission without having to leave. We've got good security. We've got good visibility on top of these fucking compound walls. <clears throat> and um, we're able to, to achieve the mission, which is disrupt enemy operations. We're able to rack up a kill count. And we don't have to worry about stepping on IEDs as long as we're just holed up in these compounds. And then uh, after a couple of days of fighting, we fucking fly out. So it's like that's the safe way to accomplish the mission uh, without um, going through unnecessary risk. And four ops of all the of the big ops that we did um, were were executed just like that, and uh, we didn't pop any IEDs. So that was how we we found the balance between. Um, between getting some and, uh, and understanding the futility of our mission there and our presence there. What was it like when you guys got injured? Uh, only one guy in my entire company stepped on an ID on foot. We had, I don't know, we probably had five trucks pop them. And in every case, everyone ended up fine. I mean, they had concussions and headaches. Um, but they, all of them went back to the fight. The one guy who popped an ID on foot, I don't know. It's the weirdest thing. I watched it happen. Uh, and my immediate reaction, well, before it happened was, uh, and I was arguing with the company commander that they should not be going into the building. Like, look, it's just not necessary. Um, like we know for a fact they put IEDs in buildings that they shoot at us from. And he sent him in anyways. And then I'm like, dude, they're going to fucking hit an ID in there. I said that to my JTAC. And then literally two seconds later, I watch it happen in my scope. And I just went, fuck. All right. And to this day, I, I haven't felt that much more than that. And I was in Wounded Warrior Battalion with him. We're in the same unit together. I think he fucking pinned Captain. On yeah, he pinned Captain on me. <laughs> when we're in the uh, the battalion the unit wow um but he lived and in that moment you know i was so desensitized and i was i was really good about disassociating myself from any emotion that wasn't motivation you know um 
that's, you know, going back, getting mentally prepared as I talk to mental health professionals now, I was actually just talking to this woman today about how, how prepared I was for everything I experienced. And I'm like, oh, what can, you know, is there any way I can share what I did to prepare mentally and emotionally with others so that they don't get so rattled and fucked up when all this shit happens to them? Now, granted, my shit wasn't that bad. Um, I'm sure some of the guys that I was with would, would be like, well, you were an officer. Um, but I mean, just relative to all of the other experiences that other units had in that same area and Iraq, especially, um, I really don't think it was that bad. So I'm, I'm very fortunate in that sense. And I can, I can speak from a perspective where it's like, I, I know that what I experienced, um, it did not rattle my soul. Um, like it has so many other people, uh, you know, being in Iraq in a fucking crowded city with a yeah. giant population. That's, that's a different world. <laughs> that's a different world. I can't, I can't relate to that. I'm lucky. Um, and so, um, I, but I was very desensitized and if I had been in that environment, I would have become more disassociated from, from reality and from pain. Um, and, uh, and so in that sense, when I, when that happens to Thine, I was just like, oh, that sucks. Okay, let's get the fucking medevac in and get him out. And then we find out he lived. It was like, sick, that's a win. And and that was it. All the other IDs, it's like, it's always fear. You know, when it was, when it was, when it happened, I didn't even experience the fear of like, oh my God, he might die. Uh, I didn't even feel that. I was just like, okay, well. I've been through this a million times in training. Here's what we got to do. It's like complete calm and acceptance of, yeah, this is what exactly what we expected. And everyone around me was calm. And in the guys who were there, you know, it, it was like 500 yards from me. Um, the guys who were there were, um, from what I heard, the Marines were calm. The a a guys were losing their fucking mind, but they always do. <laughs> yeah. They always act like they don't give a fuck, they're badasses, and then shit goes down, and they're, ah! oh, yeah. And then they calm down like when they act like they're badasses. It's the fucking funniest thing. Um, but we were trained for exactly what happened. We had literally experienced that two dozen times in training, and we, we executed exactly as we had trained. Um, you know, I remember feeling immense. All, actually, I remember that my, my only concern in that moment was the tree line to the west. And getting attacked from there. That's it. Get the fucking, um, get the bird in as far away from that tree line as possible. Get the casualty the fuck out of there. Do not land the bird near there. Like that was my only focus is what is ahead of me. And, um, and I never, you know, at no point did it, did it, you know, hit me super hard because not long after we're like, yeah, he's at Fob Edinburgh, the shock trauma platoon. He's alive. Oh, yep. He supposedly fucking he's stable on the way to the next stop, and at the next stop, yep, he's good. Uh, he's at Bethesda. He's good. So it's like cool. You know, we will get some new legs. He'll fucking he'll step his game up. We'll figure it out. <laughs> you had mentioned before that you know mentally you felt like you were so ready for combat. Like that. That's why you're not having issues now that other veterans are dealing with. Uh, to that end. Um, were you mentally prepared for the situation to pull the trigger, fire at, and kill the enemy? Because I think it's different for everybody, and we do talk a lot about it on the podcast, Donnie. Like the moment you pull that trigger, the person you were before is dead. You're never the same person again. And whether you handle it well or not, I think is is not really germane to the question. It's just a question of part of you is now different for having done that because war, in and of itself, is just an awful, awful thing that no one is, is sitting down praying for at night. Maybe some of you Marines are. You guys are a little bit tipsy at times. But, you know, uh, my simple point is, is that after you pull that trigger, do you feel anything or, or how did you handle that whole thing? This is probably going to sound really, really bad. Um, but I came into the Marine Corps with a bloodlust that was so intense and insane. Um, I mean, I'm still, uh, you know, entertaining people with stories of bloodlust to this day. 
And um, the marine culture is so – it champions the act of killing so much that, you know, there wasn't even a conversation about like, you know, you know, when you take a life and it was just like, we're here to fucking kill people. And we are the best in the world at killing people. That's what you're going to do. And you're going to be a better man for it. Like that was the culture. And I wanted to feel that. I, it's, I know it's fucking weird. Um, but coming into the Marine Corps, I'm like, this is where I need to be. This is where I need to be to, to, to make my dreams come true. I wanted to find bad people and I wanted to exterminate their existence. And, um, I think this is all born out of the time in high school when I was bullied. My only bout with suicide was from being bullied. And I thought I will spend the rest of my life teaching bullies a lesson. And so that was the mentality that I, I brought to, to, to war. And I never pulled my trigger to, to kill anybody. I was the fire support team leader. So everyone that I killed, and I say I, but it was a team effort. We had, we were as a, in, and I do have to give the JTAC, Anthony DeFlito, um, credit for the majority of the kills because they were mostly close air support kills. Um, but we did have a handful of um, Excalibur and HIMARS. And um, uh, I, I can't claim credit for mortars, but I, I, was, I, I had the, the, the coolest job in the world in combat as a fire support team leader because I, I got to kind of direct the battle in many ways, in, in a way that a company commander should. And so for that, I'm just so fucking lucky that I got that experience. And, you know, I was, I was a very appreciated person in my company because I was the guy who was responsible for dropping bombs on bodies. Like no matter where we were, whether we're in the fob and someone's out on patrol or we're on a, a legit operation, um, I am responsible for all fires. And so they, they would come to me and, uh, it was just such a fucking, I'm such a, I'm so grateful for that whole goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you were as a fire support team leader, were, were you like in a talk area watching it all on TV or were you actually in a helo or. So in the beginning of the deployment, the majority of my, the execution of my job was in the talk, no COC. And that was using um, the Aerostat blimp that had these million-dollar cameras on it. It was using that to l literally hunting. And it was like every second of the day that I wasn't working out, I was looking at the cameras with a couple guys looking for people who were placing IDs so we could put a bomb on them. And that was incredibly fun. Um, but whenever we would go on operations, I would be out with the company. And I got, I, it, it, I got to sneak up on a fucking hill on this one raid um, uh, with my team. So it was my fire support team with a squad for security. And we snuck up on a hill and under the cover of darkness. My team set up our fucking, our, um, our laptop where we could see the video feed from um, all the air support. Mm -hmm. And we set that thing up underneath a tarp with red lens and our maps had everything fucking prepped, had targets planned that I'm calling in. I had some targets planned prior, prior to going and then set some more up and uh, and got to do that while the company at daybreak went and fucking raided the village. Um, and that was one of many experiences. I did the same thing up on this hilltop in this valley. Like it was insanely fucking cool. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so I was I was fortunate to be a, a fister uh, in the middle of the battle. And, um, and whenever our bombs landed on, I had a very, very clear view on, uh, one of several different feats. Um, for a little while we carried the laptop with us on these missions, but then it was so fucking heavy. We, we, we got this new technology where it like, it drops down. It's like an eyepiece. And so the image from the, the assets in the sky are on the eyepiece that dropped down over the left eye. It was insane. It was so fucking sick. So we got to use that for like the last two or th three to four missions. And um, so we got to watch the people die. And it was just this 
incredible feeling of joy that I remembered experiencing. Um, because we were, we, we had put so much time into ensuring that they were bad and that there were no civilians around. It's like, there was no guilt associated with it. It's like, we just watched them attack us shooting from murder, murder holes and spotting us. They're sitting cross-legged Indian style in a field. They're in a tree. They're on top of this building. Like we were, we, we, we did the proper research. You know, all of my jokes about killing civilians, I can make with no remorse because I know that I never did. We were so, so careful not to. Um, so anyways, yeah, it was, it was an amazing feeling. There was never a second guess of, oh my God, I, I took a life. No, it was like, I just fucking wasted that dude. <laughs> Fuck yeah. That's incredible. Uh, yeah, when you watch that whole screen just flash white after the bomb drops. Uh, and it hits the oh, yeah, yeah. And watching, watching body parts twitching. Yeah. Guys getting this one dude got up. And we're like, oh no, fuck, he's still alive. Let's put, let's put a. Well, I wanted to fire mortar on him. <laughs> um, but uh, then we watched his guts fall out of his stomach, and it's like, oh okay, he's dead. <laughs> wow. So how does that deployment end for you? It ended fortunately. Um, you know, no deaths. And back at Camp Leatherneck, we had a good decompression of two weeks at Leatherneck and <clears throat> came home, had a great reception from a bunch of Vietnam vets. Um, and and um, the day uh, after we left was the day that Le Camp Leatherneck and Camp Bastion got attacked and was the largest loss of American aircraft since Vietnam. And we just flew out of there. So um, uh, I just remember leaving thinking, this country's fucked. This whole thing was one of the stupidest things ever. And I'm just grateful that no one in my company died. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I never I, – I didn't process the anger of – of the whole fucking war. I never processed it um, until that TV. And I am, I am processing it more now as I write season two of A Grunt's Life with uh, Jonathan Forsyth and Dylan Nashley. And as we're doing it, we're watching documentaries and we're studying it. And we're, it's just like, I watched the documentary, The Vietnam War by Ken Burns. And yes, I'm just like, excellent. whoa, that was, that was so painful, dude. Seeing that our nation that I love so much made 15 years worth of mistakes that were identical to the 20 years worth of mistakes we made in Vietnam. Identical. Like what? Did they never fucking read the history? Yeah. And, and everyone, uh, side note, everybody on that documentary who, you know, is angry, they're not angry at anything other than the government. They, yeah. they, they're just they're just pissed that they were sent to a war we could never win. They were sent to die for a country who didn't care about them and yep. uh, didn't want them there in the first place. And it, it just, you know, uh, the, the the U.S. strategy was to keep having soldiers walk into uh, uh, Viet Cong gunfire until they, they they ran out of bullets, which is a bad strategy. Yeah, yeah. It's a very well done documentary for the record. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Uh, let yeah. me ask you, uh, Donnie, about the end of your time in the Marines. Uh, I mentioned earlier you, you got medically discharged, but it wasn't due to combat injuries. So why and how? What happens? Um, I, um, my body is very weak, and I, uh, I break bones very easily. I rip tendons, rip ligaments and muscles, and um, I was never – my body um, was not hard enough uh, to do the job, but my mind was. So I, I did the job for as long as I could. My dream was to go Marsoc. And at the end of my time in Afghanistan, I was in so much pain. I'm sure we all were, but my right ankle was, was dangling off of my leg. Cause I had, I had broken it multiple times. I'd broken in the basic school and it fucking manned the fuck up and didn't stop. And then Broke it again in that martial arts instructor course that I did before IOC. Broke it again. And the doctor uh, was like, okay, well, we're going to need to schedule a surgery with you. And I just didn't go back. 
I nutted the fuck up and went to IOC with a twice over broken ankle, literally ligaments ripped off the bone, hit the fleet mountain warfare training center. Fuck it. Fucked it up even more. And then I'm just like, okay, the rest of my time here, is going to be really fucking painful. So I just kind of tried to disassociate my brain from the pain in my ankle. And then by the end of Afghanistan, when we had we're finished with combat operations, then the pain started. I started acknowledging the pain again. And I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going Marsoc. I know it. And sure enough, my dad was a doctor at Balboa Hospital. He hooked me up with MRIs and it was completely destroyed. I had reconstructive surgery not long after. Like, and, and then the doctor was like, what the fuck are you doing? How are you walking on this? And I was just like, I had to go to war, doc. And once I was done with war, it's like, okay. Um, I'm, I, I, I tried going, Mar the doctor was like, you're not going Marsoc. Shut the fuck up. You're an idiot. And so I, I, I let that dream die and I decided I would accept a retirement and uh, go pursue another dream. So, um, so anyway, so that's why I was medically retired. It was my, my right ankle, left ankle partially too. my right shoulder. I, um, the, the, the Navy actually did a surgery on it two years prior and they paralyzed it. Um, so wearing a pack, my right arm was like, not, it wasn't totally paralyzed, but it was partially paralyzed anytime I'd wear a pack. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was, it, it was like, this is just what I got to deal with. And then at the end of it, it's like, all right, well, let me fix my body. And the doctors kind of coached me. They're like, look, son, you're going to be in pain for the rest of your life. You're going to, if this thing keeps getting worse, it will be cut off in under 10 years. If you're, if you keep doing this thing to your shoulder, it's going to be fucking destroyed. Shoulder replacements suck. You do not want that. And so I was finally like, okay, I guess now that I survived combat, when I always kind of assumed I would die, uh, I guess I have the rest of my life to look forward to. So maybe I should start taking care of my body. And, and that was that. But that's why I was medically retired. It, on, on my paperwork, it says, says uh, right shoulder paralysis, right ankle reconstruction, left ankle needs reconstruction. And that was that. I mean, you seem most people in that position end up are, are very frustrated because they can't go out on their own terms. Were you okay with the decision? Um, e yes, yeah, I, I I was, and I, you know, <clears throat> again, I'm very very fortunate because I have an amazing ability to see what is in front of me much more clearly than what is behind me. It's a, it's a, I, I, I'm, I'm realizing now it's a gift because there are many instances when I've things like, maybe I'm not asked things like this. I just see other people. I see that they're, they keep talking about the past, the past, the past. And I'm just like, I don't even know how to do that unless somebody asks me, uh, all my mind thinks about is the future. What is ahead of me? And because I am a healthy, privileged, fucking white male, I have a very bright future ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have the ability to do anything I set my mind to. So there's no reason to look back. There's no reason to dwell on it. You know what I mean? It's like, as soon as I accept it, okay, the Marsoc dream is dead. Um, and, uh, you know, truth be told, I think I, I could have tried to find some work around in the system. I was thinking about, you know, how can I pay someone to change my code in the system and go join the army and go spec ops in the army. And I was like, if I really wanted to make that happen, I could go fucking make the money, pay someone to commit a crime of changing my, my, my government information. And I could make that happen if I really wanted to. And I'm like, but no. I choose to let this go. I will pursue another dream and I will find happiness elsewhere. So once I did that, it's like, I, I, I didn't, I haven't looked back since. So when and how, uh, well, first, what you, year month is this? When you end up getting, uh, when you retire? Uh, October, 2015. Okay. So from that standpoint, when and how does vet TV get started? So Vet TV was started. No, October 2014. I'm sorry. 
Um, Bet TV was started. The idea came to me in May or June of 2016 when I was doing the nonprofit. The nonprofit had taken, that was my life. And um, so May, June 2016. And then what was the next thing? Uh, I I didn't tell anyone because fr- I'm like, once the idea hit me, I'm like, how the fuck have the Black Rifle guys not done this yet? That was literally my first thought. Of all the people, like these guys are making military humor. It's not 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 the way I'm doing it. I'm doing more um, storytelling. Um, they were just doing military humor at that time. But I'm like, this is right up their alley. They have the resource to do it. How come? So I didn't tell a soul. I fleshed it out in my head. I asked a lot of questions. I, I designed the logo to be a combination of MTV and BET, mm-hmm. veteran and television. And, um, and then I, I actually finally, after I trademarked it, I told Jared Taylor. And cause he had reached out to me and he was like, yo, you're funny as fuck. Come hang out. And then I, ever since then, I've, I've been one of the toys that he picks up and plays with when it's convenient for him. And I'm more than happy to accept that. <laughs> um, and, uh, he's been a phenomenal mentor to me. I, it's, I, it's insane how lucky I am for, for what he has taught me mm-hmm. and, and, and hooked me up with. Uh, and so, um, I told him the idea for Vet TV and he kind of fucking shut it down. And he was like, I don't know, dude, it's really hard. You're going to have to fucking think about this. You have to do this. You have to do that. You know how fucking hard that is. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, he's shutting it down because he wants to fucking do it first or he's already had the idea. And I'm just like, damn it. So I'm like, I better move fast. And so I made a blog post that, laid out the vision and the mission of veteran television and then a plan for how to make it happen. And the answer was a Kickstarter campaign. And it was a call out for anyone. If you like this idea, let's fucking do this. And it was literally a perfect example of putting it out to the universe. And then within a couple of weeks, I had dozens of people. Well, I say hundreds um, who were like, oh my God, this is fucking brilliant, bro. Let's, I, I want to help. But dozens of people who, who actually I knew would, would actually, um, put in the time and make the effort. And, uh, I, I finally settled on, uh, I don't know, maybe eight guys, uh, who I met through the nonprofit and had been working with as leaders of the nonprofit and, um, guys I served with who were my Marines. So when you together, say the nonprofit, are you referring to a reverent warriors? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. I mean, I wanted to talk about it, but you kept saying nonprofit, so I didn't know if there was another project in there before that came around. Uh, no, no, that was it. Okay. That was my life. And so um, it's like, okay, we're going to do a Kickstarter campaign. We're going to launch in fucking in, in October. And I was being advised not to do October because that was the election. And, um, and I was thinking to myself, well, fuck, if I wait till after the election – I'm going to have to wait till people, everyone blew their Christmas money and I'm going to need to wait at least until spring when people have money to spend again. And then the competition with other Kickstarter campaigns is going to be significantly higher at that time. And who knows what else is going to happen? Fuck it. We just got to go full send right now. And so it was like, all right, guys, October 5th, that's when we're launching. Let's do this shit. And, and that's what we did. When you started it, did you know or think that it would get as big as it did? Like, did you have a sense that this is a, oh my God, hot idea that, that, you know, the world sort of needs, so to speak, or was this just something you were doing because it was a passion project and you didn't exactly know where it would lead? Um, before I ever told anyone, I envisioned it to be exactly what it is to this very day. I identically. And I know that might sound crazy, but I saw a vision of it already. It existed. It was called Black and Sexy TV. I, I, when I c- came up with the idea, I Googled how to start my own Netflix. And on the, first, on the bottom of the first page of results was uh, this thing called VHX. It was a platform where you could host your own videos behind a firewall and have a subscription. 
And one of the uh, companies that it was using the platform, one of their biggest ones was called Black and Sexy TV. And here was the verbiage for that company. It said, we believe th this is television for young and progressive black people, 20 to 40. We believe that entertainment for the black community has become watered down uh, by Tyler Perry, BET, and the white establishment. So we are going to create what we believe is, um, is authentic entertainment and television for the young and progressive black community that accurately reflects the young black experience in America. And I read that and I thought, holy shit, just change the word black for veteran. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I could, I could just look at the, the, the website, the way they laid out the shows, the branding, the organization of everything. I'm like, that's it. So I literally had a crystal clear vision of what I wanted to create. And we are using that same platform to this day. And I actually just had a conversation with the founder of Black and Sexy TV last night and thanked him for, the, for, for providing me with that vision. So, um, so yeah, I, um, I dream big and I believe that I can do anything I set my mind to. And I'm like, I'm going to create a fucking television network and it's going to be a fucking goddamn empire one day. All I have to do is just keep working at it. I guess that's as simple as things are for me. If I can envision it, I can create it. And that's, that's why I'm a filmmaker. Cause that's what filmmaking is. That's pretty impressive. I mean, you know, again, uh, just, it's not the same thing, but you know, we set out for this podcast. I, I didn't really, I, I knew we had a, an idea that wasn't really in a space that a lot of people weren't doing telling these veteran stories. Right. I mean, yeah, you see him chronicled on 60 minutes and it's a eight minute block with a commercial in between. So it's not really in depth, you know, but uh, in the three plus years we've been doing this, it's we we have found a, a niche that not many other people are investing into. But you know, we I didn't have any vision for what it would grow into. Uh, I always think it's impressive that you can have that vision and that foresight ahead of time, and all of a sudden it just works out the way you think it's going to. Well, thank you. I um, again, I think I'm one of the most fortunate people in the world. I mean, like you said, that's not I, that's not a common thing, and yet yet I. I I, I am able to do that. And I just have to give credit to my parents for the way they raised me. They, they dedicated their life to raising good children who, and giving them opportunities that they didn't have and taking advantage of all of the opportunities America gives us. And, um, I am a product of fucking amazing parenting. So I, all the credit goes to them. Uh, some of the things you have on Vet TV that people may not be familiar with, like Veterans Laughing Together or Checkpoint Charlie. I mean, tell us about some of the shows that you have. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, we have a wide range of shows. Yes. Um, everything has um, some element of dark humor to it. And the shows, some of there, – there's the spectrum of silliness – silliness to subtleness we have the entire spectrum on the network because there's just different flavors of humor some people love the silliness more other people don't like it they want something that that comes across as more serious and dry and um so there's checkpoint charlie that's about army military police um just imagine a cross between letter kenny and uh reno 911 okay <laughs> uh, we have a grunt's life that's like if generation kill was a dark comedy like in, they intended it to be like Gen Generation Kill was funny, but if they were trying to make you laugh, um, that would be a grunt's life. Um, then we have the shop, which is the office, but in an army uh, S1 shop. Uh, we have Recruiter's Mission First, which I don't know what to compare that to. It's such a brilliant show. That show could be on Netflix easily. Um, and, uh, and so that's about a Marine recruiter who comes into, he's a brand new recruiter and uh, the recruiting life just, it ruins, it crushes his soul. Um, and uh, what else? We have Team Bamf. It's about, a, it's like South Park, but with a Marine infantry fire team in Afghanistan. <laughs> that is one of the funniest shows to me. And it, that, that the brilliance there, we didn't even make that. That's by these guys. Um, they don't want their names used, but Veteran Standard Issue is their company. And uh, we bought it from them, but 
boy, oh boy, are those guys fucking brilliant. And by the way, uh, when you talk about the office, the shop which you have for for those non military listening, uh, uh-huh. the humor in the office um, is exactly what an S one humor would be like. I mean, it, it is <laughs> it, it, it is shit that only people in the S one shop laugh at. And nobody else does. Oh my god! That I uh, thank you so much for acknowledging that because it is the goal of our writers to. Um, to study the community that they're, they're creating for, right? The show, the shop was not made for grunts. No. Right. Like, <laughs> I'm, I've talked to some grunts. They've seen it. They're like, ah, eh, it's not my cup of tea. Every single person I've ever met who has worked in any form of administration in any branch of the military is like, the shop is my shit. That show spoke to me. Yep. Um, so um, those guys nailed it. The writers, Braden Smith and uh, Greg Kelly, they fucking nailed that. Um, anyway, devil docks. Oh my gosh. That show. Um, it's about a Navy corpsman who is g- crossing over from blue side to green side and, um, takes place in this, uh, seventh engineer support battalion BAS. That show is like scrubs, but much more dark and violent in a Marine BAS. I mean, this is something for everybody in the military. Really? It is. Totally. Yeah. Now, every show is not for everyone in the military. Um, You know, we come into a show with the intent to entertain only the community that the show is for. And we it's really just broken down by MOS. Right. That's how we found the most success as a business when we create is we don't try and create a show that everyone who's ever served is going to love. That will never happen. And that is a guaranteed recipe for failure. Um. We create a show that we hope everyone in that MOS loves, and that's it. And that drives the authenticity of the show to a degree that resonates with a larger audience. But providing that focus from the beginning is the key. Impressive uh, stuff, man. I mean, it really is. Like, you just scroll down the list, and and I could just tell from the titles what they're about. But, it, you know, I mean, it... it, it, it it should speak. There is a show for everybody in the military. There, like you'll, 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 nice. you, you will relate to one of them. I mean, I, I feel pretty confident in saying that. To that end, um, Thank you. a lot of this is, I guess, therapeutic or somewhat, you know, uh, cathartic for people watching uh, because some of it, as you mentioned, is the dark humor that we've all had to live through at some point. If you've been through a deployment, um, was was there any purposeful intention for that piece? Oh, yeah. Um, You know, the whole concept of the network was born out of the belief that if we can bring veterans together to laugh, we will create bonds and connections. And those bonds and connections will form a sense of community. And community is needed to prevent isolation, which prevents suicide. This is all the psychology that we learned from the nonprofit. And we just applied the psychology of the nonprofit irreverent warriors and the Silky's Hikes events. We applied that into television and entertainment. And the result is this, the, the same amount of laughter that someone might get watching one of our shows that they might get with their favorite civilian show. That laughter ends up having this fascinating positive and therapeutic and community building effect and it's all done intentionally so the the vision statement of our business is that we will bring the military community together with laughter is, and that leads to less suicide is there a, a a goal to make vet tv bigger take it to a different platform or are you guys kind of content where you are and and the audience where you have is can grow as big as you want it to be yeah. So um, my my vision for the business is that we will always um, have our own subscription video on demand that can serve the community. Because as soon as we, um, as soon as you know our thing ends up on someone else's platform, in terms of like our entire platform is on someone else's, then. Uh, the type of content might end up changing. And that's a very unhealthy thing. So in order to prevent that from happening, 
uh, we must always focus on our community and keep the SVOD service um, you know, just for us. Outside of that, though, we're going to be starting a, a movie division, a, a comic book and regular book publishing division, a podcasting network, which we're one of these days we'll probably reach out. We're far from doing that, but one day we'll reach out and ask you if you want to be a part of it. Because what we want to do is collect podcasts that are serving our community and then help you guys market. The, the vision that we have for it right now, and again, this is all rough shit, is that we don't want anyone's money. Um, if you're well, that's good because we're not making any. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, most of the podcasts that I've seen in the veteran space aren't making any either. Um, but what we want to do is promote all of you bring everyone together. So we'll have like podcasting retreats. So all of the podcasters will bring together for a weekend to talk about how we can, for one, make the quality of our work better, share our networks with each other, and then also ensure that we are bringing positive messages to the community. Even if some of the podcasts are silly or they're raunchy, there's always an opportunity to add some um, altruistic value um, into every form of entertainment. You know, entertainment brings eyeballs. And then what we do with those eyeballs is up to us. And so if we can just get everyone on the same page, like, yeah, look, keep doing what you're doing. Be silly, be raunchy, be weird. But just add a couple of these positive messages. Um, that's all we want in, in, in terms of a network. And uh, the cross-marketing opportunities are huge. So there's podcasting, movies, publishing, and then events. Events is really where um, I'm excited to grow because if events, the in-person connection, that's where it's, that's what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, uh, you do that a little bit with the reverent warriors. Um, you have the hikes that you put together and everything else, but, um, you keep this whole thing on, I don't want to say it's on the side, but it seems to be at least in, in the veteran space, you know, it's secondary to vet TV cause there's so many more eyeballs on it, but uh, what does a reverent warriors mean to you? Why'd you start it? And, and what is its purpose at this point? Um, I started it because, uh, when my buddy killed himself, his mother was crying over the casket. She was screaming, why, why, why? He was wailing. He was fucking miserable. And as I'm sitting there crying to myself, I'm thinking, and this is a Marine buddy, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. From the boy of a time. Um, gotcha. And, uh, he had lost his legs and sang it. And so he was, uh, uh you know, he's in, in a dark place. He was young. It was, it was really sad. And, um, and I remember thinking to myself, I got to give his mother a reason why I got to give her an answer. He, he died so that others could live. And, um, I, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I just thought at some point I wanted to just bring people together to have a good time. Cause I've, I've been doing that for my friends since, uh, I was uh, probably 17. Like everyone's rallying at my house on Friday and Saturdays. And we're going to go play sports. We're going to go throw a party, uh, get in a fight, like whatever. Like that's just what I do. I, I collect incredibly funny, good hearted people, bring them together and we have an amazing time. So I'm like, well, I'm going to do that for these guys in the war battalion. And, uh, and then it was hard to get them together because, you know, injuries, um, after I left, people kind of went their own ways. Then I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna get my guys from Afghan together. All the guys I deployed with. And, uh, and me and my best friend, uh, Ryan Loy at the time, we were just like, yeah, let's fucking get everyone. Let's get, let's get the gang together. And, um, uh, we figured it'd be like 10 of us and we got some news coverage and, uh, he brought up the idea of silkies. Actually, I was just like, yo, let's just put some backpacks on. Let's feel, feel some, some weight on our backs. So we feel like fucking like grunts again. And then, uh, you know hike up and down the, the boardwalk on the beach and stop at bars and just have a good time. And he was just like, yeah, dude, and let's do it in silkies. I was like, oh my God, yes. And then we did a news thing in silkies and it blew up. 75 people showed up, got Marine Corps Times picked it up, got went national. And now I'm getting hit up by people all over. They, hey, will you do a silky psych for me? And I'm like, well, I can't do it for you, but I can tell you how to do it. So I made a blog post, say, this is how you do a silky psych. And they start popping up all over the country. And then I start getting invited to their events and I start showing up. 
and um, the first one I went to, two weeks after mine in San Diego, had 275 veterans at that event in Houston, Texas. And the guy who ran it was Mark Metzger. He is a big brother and mentor to me to this day. He is a fucking God amongst men. And there have been over 300 veterans coming to his hikes twice a year ever since. And I was like, wow, this is powerful. And I started going to all of these events. And, you know, I'd give a little speech, make people laugh, make friends. Every hike was the best weekend of my life. And I had no idea what I was doing. But my dad kind of challenged me to, to get control of this movement that was going on. It wasn't a nonprofit yet. It was just hikes going on. And people liked the brand, Irreverent Warriors, and so they were just kind of rocking the name. And It's nothing official. So I incorporated as a nonprofit to kind of manage this movement and make sure that, that it, it was it had a standard of quality and fun and stayed safe and people weren't trying to use it for other intentions. And then that was my first experience in business was trying to run this nonprofit with volunteers from across the country and um, manage a, a minuscule budget, you know, of – you know, a couple hundred dollars here and, and there to, you know, these events were all hosted by individual people. And I threw my money in every now and then to help an event be successful. And, uh, it just kept growing and growing and growing. And to this day, 60,000 veterans have come to our events, 60,000. And every event, it's a giant group of veterans who come together and they feel like they're home again. They show up with big smiles and they're laughing and they're hugging and they're all – and it's just like the jokes are flying. It, you know, It's just like the best parts of the military without the bullshit. You get to show up and you know, be, have fun with your bros and, and your chicas. And, um, and then what ended up happening is people felt so comfortable. They started opening up to each other. And then now, you know, by the end of every event, they're fucking – people are crying on each other's shoulders and shit. So they got new best friends and little support groups are happening naturally. And in all of you – know, we're, we're in like 70 cities or some shit. I don't even know anymore. And it just all builds organically. Organic community building. That's what Irreverent Warriors is. That's the key to suicide prevention is community. We don't rally to like get the government to do more. I, I hate that shit. I don't like asking the government for more. Like, we can just do it ourselves. If we just come together, put our minds in some shit, we can all do it. You know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm always the forefront of, of the speaking for Vet TV. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think anyone feels as comfortable speaking about this, this shit like I do. But, I mean, it was, it was a huge group of people who worked fucking insane hours. I mean, insane. Family crushing work ethic, right? To build that TV and a Reverend Warriors, and um, and it's yeah, it's just a massive team effort, and it's all it all just comes down to the mission statement. Like we had good mission statements from the beginning, and that drove everything, and it provided focus, and it didn't hurt that these are enjoyable organizations to be a part of. Like there's a lot of fun. If you're a filmmaker, if you're an, you're, if you're an aspiring filmmaker. There is no better opportunity for you to get good at your craft and to feel valued as a filmmaker than you will at that TV. There is, I, I say that with full confidence. There is no other fucking place that you will actually come in and get the reps writing and producing and directing and acting the complete filmmaking process. Um, and the people that we have are so stupidly fucking talented. It's unbelievable. And, uh, and everyone who joins our culture is like, they better step up. You know, it's like, it's like joining USC. You know, like if you join that team, like you ain't shit until you put, put some fucking a couple years in right. because there are so many talented people around you who will elevate your game. And that's, that's, I, I, I would attribute some of our success to that is that not only do we have all these talented people that are willing to put in the time, but they all have this desire to make great film and television and because of that it's a culture of high performers 
It's intense, yeah. man. I mean, it sounds great. Like, honestly, you know, it, it, it makes me want to sign up, you know, like, and be part of it all because, well, <laughs> yes. but, but that's it, right? I mean, it's, it's the one thing about the veteran community you can always count on, you know, that, that we're, we're always better at taking care of each other than anybody else. And anytime you can put a bunch of us together in a room, um, whatever the project is, whatever the mission set is, whatever the skill set is, we'll figure out a way through it um, yeah. and do Which the best job we can. Totally. And so, you know, I mean, sign me up, man. I- I'm on your next project. Oh, my God. Let's do that. Be- By the way, oh, my God. <laughs> I remember our conversations from a couple years ago when I was doing a Rev Warriors. I remember I stood you up one morning. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So oh, it's, it's all God, good, but I-, I will hold it against you that you owe me one. But certainly, I, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, hey, I got to make it up to you, dude. You- when, you- when you come out to San Diego... We'll, we'll do something awesome together. Outstanding. Well, listen, Donnie, man, you're an inspiration, brother. I uh, love your story, your honesty, and certainly uh, Vet TV continues to be something that, uh, you know, is, is thriving within the veteran community and beyond. And we certainly appreciate all your efforts uh, in suicide prevention and mental health for, for veterans. But it's just been great to get to talk to you again. Great to get to know you and uh, certainly wishing you nothing but the best, brother. Oh, I remember all our, our pre- I remember thinking to myself, this, this guy is so, he was a Lieutenant Colonel, Battalion Camaro. He's a fucking cool guy. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that from the past. And it, it came back when you were telling me about being a BC uh, early in this combo. And we were on a such a roll. I didn't want to fucking bring it up, but thank you for all those kind words, man. Um, <clears throat> I'm just incredibly grateful for good parenting. And I have surrounded myself with amazing people. I mean, every step of the way, um, I just have such cool people around me. And, and that has, that is that is really what it takes. I'm I've trying to really hone down my life coaching. Is that <laughs> you have to have? It's not enough to have a vision or drive. The people who who achieve real success are those who are able to rally unbelievable talent around them and keep them around. That's the key. The people who have great talent, but you know, they push people away and shit. Like you're, you, you'll never reach the degree of success that you want. You have to truly love and respect and trust and support and coach and mentor and also be humbled by the people around you. And, you know, next time we talk, then we'll talk about how, what a fucking piece of shit I am. And we got it. We'll balance this whole thing out. Talk about all, all my failures. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Incredible stuff, man. Donnie O'Malley, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground, brother. Thank you so much for having me, man. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.